Welcome to the Weekly Mac. Today we'll be having an inspiring talk with the businesswoman, lawyer, and former vice president of Football Club Barcelona, Maria Teixidó. We'll be listening to an indie pop folk band from Capalladas, Privis. And there'll be a daring street video about Camacus and Fisher Pins with our reporter Humberto González. This is the Weekly Mag, your TV show in English, hosted by Marcela Topor. Hello and welcome to the Weekly Mag, the show for you if you want to be entertained, learn a few things and keep up your English. And let's kick off today's show with words and facts from Mario Serra, Matthew Tree and Umberto Gonzalez. Hello all, welcome to the Weekly Mag. Hello. Hi there, how are you? And we start with Marius, our expert in uh, words and mysteries. He's going to reveal the strange origins of some uh, English idioms. Mm -hmm. uh, Marius, which yeah. ones? Um, do you know any idioms about bones? About bonds. I feel it in my bones that we do. <laughs> <laughs> feel in your bones? That That's was exactly okay. the same one I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, it's one me I too. use quite often. Yeah, I feel it too. in my bones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a common one. Well, we'll be commenting on that idiom and among others about bones. And of course, I'll have the solution of last week's guess what? Do you remember it? With an additional hint. Glasses up to talk about bread. It was a five letter word and I know from your eyes that you know it, but don't tell anyone. You've got oh. some more minutes right. to think about it. Okay. And our reporter from Virginia, Umberto Gonzalez, has decided to explore the differences between the city and the countryside. Yes, and I found more funny names that the city dwellers and the country people of Catalonia have for each other. Take a sneak peek because it's fun, y'all. Do the people from Barcelona or the city call the village people yeah. something? YMCA. People from the mountain. Farmers. Farmers. We call people in the city, city slickers. What do you call them here? Bishy beans. <laughs> people that pee on pines, y'all. Kampanga. Many years ago, all the streets are not uh, paved. Go very uh, dirty. Can you walk like a kampanga? I imagine that push the dress, no? Yes. Like... Or maybe this, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, Umberto looks like you bumped into a traditional topic, also quite funny. Yes, yeah? you're going to see. <laughs> Looking forward to the video. And now let's go to uh, Matthew, who is uh, bringing yet another unexpected international catenal connection. And Matthew, and it also has something to do with the countryside, right? in the sense that it's one of the products that's most exported from the Catalan countryside. And in fact, it's my favorite product exported from the Catalan countryside, cava, the drink oh. cava. And um, I don't know if anyone here knows why it's called cava specifically. I think we do, but we're not going to spoil it, are we, Marius? That's it. Well, Cava, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so I just, just give the answer. <laughs> just Cava is the Catalan uh, word for cellar. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, a special type of sort of curved cellar, which is where they store the bottles. But the reason it's called Cava and not Champagne, which is what everybody called it before for mm, several decades, it's because in 1972, uh, the, the French, uh, what you call that, the denomination of champagne, said it was illegal to call anything champagne that didn't come out of the champagne area in France. So all the people who made champagne in Catalonia decided we have to come up with another name. We have to come up with a name that's uh, uh, going to be commercial, that's going to work and they came up with the idea to use the name for the cellars, Cava, and that's how Cava. it started. Now, why not sparkling wine like, es, uh, is it Eskimos? Eskimos, Eskimos. Because it isn't sparkling wine. It isn't sparkling oh. wine because it's made according to the same method as is used for champagne. And the reason for that is because back in 1872, uh, the son of a well-known Catalan uh, winemaker, Josep Raventos, he went off to, Cham to the Champagne area in France. He, it's very Catalan, this actually. He, he worked in the, the company just as a normal worker, but he carried a secret notebook with him and took down notes of the whole Champagne making process, came back to Catalonia Fantastic. and set up Champagne in Catalonia. 
I think that's payback because they did the same thing to the creme, uh, crema catalana with us, with their creme brulee. So it's <laughs> payback. Exactly. It's revenge. So um, what's the difference, uh, forgive my ignorance, but what's the difference between um, sparkling wine that Umberto mentioned? And in England, they use uh, a lot the term prosecco, right? Prosecco is, is the Italian Italy. version of sparkling wine. Okay. And it's... Um, We'll get onto that later, but it's the main competitor of, of Cava on the, in, in the international market. And I won't give you my, my opinion of Prosecco just yet, but <laughs> it's, it's worth saying that the, also there is a group of Catalans led by an artist called uh, Chico Cabañas who are trying to put a copyright on the word champagne spelt in Catalan, X-A-M-P-A-N-Y, because they say that's not the same as champagne. It's spelt differently, it's pronounced differently. Exactly. And they, and they want to bring that back as the trademark. I'm really into the cava word now, though. I really like cava. I uh, prefer that to the word champagne. I think it differentiates us a lot more, and I like that. Mm -hmm. I think Mario was Lots disagree. of Catalan speakers <laughs> still now prefer champagne really? because it yeah. sounds more festive uh, as a word i mean but of course there are commercial reasons to to say cava mm -hmm. right? to say cava yeah. yeah yeah so so how international is uh cava it's, um, it, it's does it really have a lot of success on the international market 140 different countries and of course when they started off in 1972 using the the uh, the word or the trademark cava Nobody in the world knew what cava was, so it took a while to take off. And 30 years ago, it was only selling around about 40 million bottles in the, in the entire planet. Wow. But just three years ago, for example, that figure had gone up to 162.2 wow. million bottles take your wow. mouth again. a year <laughs> sold uh, all, over the, all over the world. And who buys it? Okay, yeah. um, if I give you everybody, <laughs> 140 <laughs> countries, but I'll give you the names of the five countries that drink most cava, just to, if you want to take a guess, be my guest, to see mm. which one of these countries is the one that drinks most cava. Belgium, the United Kingdom, the United States, Germany, and Japan. Japan, I will vote. You go for Japan? I'll, I'll go for Belgium. No <laughs> idea, to be honest. Okay, Sorry. It's, it's actually Germany. Germany, Germany drinks more cava okay. than the whole of the United States yeah. oh. together. But they drink beer as well. <laughs> beer and cava, they are drinking all the time. That's right. Well, they eat all those sausages. <laughs> you know, wow. I don't. But the, the amazing thing is they drink uh, more cava than the whole of the United States. But what I didn't know until I started doing a bit of research was that cava is starting to become really fashionable in, in the United States. But seriously fashionable. There's a, uh, a Catalan... Shut Shut the front door. That's another idiom. <laughs> I cannot believe this. I, I didn't know about Cava until I got here. No, Sorry. really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. if you go to well. the University of California at Davis, there's a regular Cava tasting session run by a, a Catalan enologist who's called Sergi Canals. But what I found really fascinating is that very recently, there's been a thing in America, in the whole of the United States, about craft cocktails which are made with cava. And I've got two of them here. One is called the Aviso, this is from Minnesota, and it's gin, lemon juice, mango bitters, and cava. And then there's one from Las Vegas, from Las Vegas, which is called The Sun Also Rises, the title of Hemingway's first novel, mm. which is rum, grapefruit cordial, absinthe foam, oh. and cava. I mean, that should be enough to <laughs> dull the pain of living, if you see what I mean. You know? Oh my God. Yeah. Well, anyway, Umberto, have you ever been to the Napa Valley? Mm. Which is very famous. No, I haven't. I know I'm no? bad. I've so never been to the, Vegas. what's the I'm... American version of cava? The what it's what it's called champagne or it's champagne. I have uh, no whole, idea. My whole time in the United States, we knew about champagne and we knew about prosecco. So when you prosecco. went out, you would actually buy one or order one of the two. But it's very expensive in the United States to order champagne or prosecco. So cava, I think, would be m more affordable, and it's probably becoming the rage in the United States now because of its price. Because I did go to Sweden, and I found cordonil in mm. Sweden and uh, all the sweets are buying it because of the price also. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. this is the, the problem well, with Prosecco yeah. is that it's, it's been marketed much better abroad than Cava has. So if you go to Holland, if you go to England, if you go to Sweden, 
and the United States, you're more likely to get Prosecco but available. It's, it's normal because there are lots of restaurants uh, of Italian cuisine uh, all over the world, so that Prosecco can be uh, more exhibited right. everywhere than mm -hmm. Cabo. No, it's true. And precisely, uh, we're talking about quality and, and price that leads us to a new term that appeared on the, on the market. Uh, it's uh, curpinat, the term curpinat. It's a general term, a general brand for cava. But what kind of uh, cava it refers to? It's a kind of collective name for about 10 different brands of cava, which are upmarket. Upmarket means the price range goes from 13 to 14 euros okay. upwards. From uh, the Panades region only? Or? Only from the Panades region, because uh, Corpinat, the name comes from the Latin Pineus, which is the, the Latin word for the Panades region of Catalonia, okay. and Cor from the, word, the Catalan word for heart. So what it's saying, the name, if, you, if you're really into well, this, is that their carvers come from the heart of the Panades region in Catalonia, the wow. wine growing region. Wow. Very interesting. But the, the thing about Corpinat is they have to be ecological wines, they have to go through a certain uh, process of uh, the, the time and all that. The idea of Corpinat was to get away from the cheap carvers because there are some very cheap carvers yeah. on the market which are officially carvers. They sell for two euros, they are officially made like champagne, but they are not good carvers. So, these, the idea of this collective name Corpinat is to, is to get away, to sort of distinguish themselves from these cheap uh, carvers. The whole problem with Corpinat is the name, because if you're English, it's like you don't, I mean, anybody can say carver, you know, yeah. anybody in the world, it's two syllables. But an English person would say something like Corpinat, Corpinat, <laughs> you know, and you go into a restaurant and you order Two glasses of Corpinat, oh, please. Corpinet. It's it's not going to work, you know. So that's the perhaps one of the problems is the name. It's very recent. Okay. It's I didn't too, know about that. I, I didn't it's know about this either. This end, is the first time. end of 2018. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, very interesting conversation about Kava. We learned a lot today, uh, Matthew. Okay, thank you. <laughs> very and uh, it's uh, time now to go to uh, Marius, who is going to amaze us with uh, some facts, in this case about words. So let's hear some English expressions, some of which, as uh, Marius said, have to do with bones. Bones. There are several idioms I have, but the one I heard, heard recently, which I like a lot, it says, Better a broken bone than a broken spirit. It tries to explain that the children must play a lot, especially outside the houses. So if they get harmed, no, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's better that they learn and they hurt themselves a little bit or more than a little bit, than uh, stay at home and uh, get later all kind of this mental sickness or depression. Everybody has a skeleton in the closet. Everybody has a secret and dark past, and I like it. One of the expressions who like in English is hit the sack, because I don't know, I like that uh, you push something and go to sleep, because I'm, all the day I'm stressed for the work, and I'm waiting for hit the sack and go to sleep. Well, the first one went uh, better a broken bone than a broken spirit, mm -hmm. but I suppose it depends which bone <laughs> it is, right? Yeah, you have a point there, Marcella. But I, I think this is a very positive uh, thought, more than an idiom. And I, I did some research and better a broken bone than a broken spirit. It was a motto by a lady, Lady Marjorie Allen. It was an English landscape architect and promoted child welfare she advocated for adventure playgrounds. So that was her motto. Um, in fact, she died the same year than uh, Cava was imposed in 1973 or, or 73 in this fact. So it's quite recent, but it was more than an idiom. I, I was astounded that he mentioned it because it's quite clear, better a broken bone than a broken spirit. For a I've child. never heard that one. Have I've you? never heard that one either. I was oh, just going to ask agree you. on that one. <laughs> it's more a thought, yeah. maybe a, a, yeah. a thought uh, mm. and like an idea, right? But with bones, of course, there are lots of idioms. For instance, I, if I feel something in my bones, 
It means I get it by intuition. I, I, yes. I maybe haven't yes. studied. Like Umberto. <laughs> like you. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Or if I'm chilled to the bone, it's uh, that it's really, really cold, right? It's chill. Um, it, it also means sometimes if you're chilled to the bones, you're scared. You're scared. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you, you can be cold or scared, yeah. right? Yeah. But my favorite one is sticks and stones may break my bones. Do you know that? But words, words will never hurt me. Oh, <laughs> nice. That's like a response. Nice. <laughs> and, and, and often, I guess it's the same in the States, but uh, we use just the first three words of that. So if you hear something unpleasant about yourself or someone insults you, you just say sticks and stones. Yeah. We say the same thing. Yeah. yeah. So it's you, like you all know. said. Yeah. Uh -huh. This is right. used in response of an insult, for instance, um, making uh, that okay, I'm not going to talk about that, and you are not going to hurt me. Uh, words uh, don't hurt me. Just you will hurt me if you uh, just uh, throw a stone to me. Right. Exactly. To use another idiom, it's just water off a duck's back. <laughs> That's it. Well, I have never sense. heard that one. No? <laughs> no? No, I've never heard that one. I, I, I like it. Oh, really? <laughs> well, even, I, that? even I heard really? it. Really? Okay. <laughs> I made some research and I, I, I found that it appeared, it's sticks and stones uh, thing, appeared in America in first time in 1862. And it was in the Christian Recorder. It was an American periodical um, with largely a black audience mm -hmm. so maybe it was like a motto to say mm, don't worry about words don't worry about being insulted sticks and stones mm -hmm. okay that would be yeah a time when black americans were regularly yeah insulted, insulted. that's yeah. it that's it that's exactly right. okay and let's talk now about another good one <laughs> skeletons in the closet skeletons in the closet so have you got um, uh, any of them um, I, I, I'm afraid I don't have any skeleton in my closet. Oh, come on, uh, no. <laughs> I think no. This morning wasn't there. <laughs> but to have a skeleton in the closet uh, means um, to, to have a secret concealed, something oh. that maybe is not uh, uh, good uh, uh, to show. So. It was coined in England in 19th century, this one, but it changed afterwards. I don't know if uh, by uh, this uh, water closet, uh, I mean this WC thing that now we all over the world associate to a lavatory, but now I think, if you don't use it, correct me, that it's used a skeleton in my cupboard. Is it? I've always said the a skeleton in the cupboard. Oh, yeah. never in the closet then. Okay, first of all, I had never heard the word cupboard. Ah, how do you pronounce a cupboard? Cupboard. Cupboard. You say cupboard. cupboard. Okay. Cupboard. He would say cupboard. Cupboard. Before I moved here from my English friends, and why don't you call it a cabinet? I mean, like, a it cabinet. sounds so cabinet. archaic. We say kitchen cabinet or something like that. A board that has a cup on it. It sounds like uh, <laughs> archaic to me. I had never heard. And now a skeleton in the cupboard. Cupboard, cupboard. sorry. In the cupboard, <laughs> okay. Well, but you've yeah. got okay. a cap board, so it's quite uh, transparent as a word. You take your caps and put inside the cupboard, right? Yeah. But also, England is, uh, as, as we know, a very old-fashioned country. So maybe it's because of that. <laughs> so wait, if there's it's a possibility. A, if there's a gay in the closet, a person in the closet, for example, yeah. do you say he's in the cupboard too? No. Gay people come out of the closet. Yeah. They don't come out of the cupboard. No, cupboard. because we take the cupboard. expression from America. Oh, well, I okay. thought that they came yeah. out of the wardrobe. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, they don't no. come out of the wardrobe. No. We, we We're all fully not, dressed. Not <laughs> out of the cabinet. <laughs> yeah. I'm still having a hard time with cupboard. cupboard. So, finally, I'll okay. put bones aside okay. and we'll finish out with our third idiom, this uh, very direct one. To hit the sack, right? It means to go to bed. And it has an American origin in the early 20th century when mattresses were very hard. Uh, sacks were filled with straw, maybe with horse hair, no feathers at all, and uh, rough materials. Sometimes they say, hit the hay. 
maybe, yeah. meaning, do you say? Yeah, we say both, yeah. Both of them. Hit the but sack, hit the hay. The hay, uh, it may mean that you are just uh, sleeping on the floor, because the hay you've got there, right? Well, we just use it for sleeping, but we say both, yeah. Do you say both? No, we just say go to bed. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. oh, you didn't you didn't have straw you know, mattresses oh, back right. then, no, didn't no. you? We we never <laughs> slept it's on formal, the floor. Right? <laughs> Anytime we uh, we have we've got another uh, little idiom with sack, which is get the sack, which means to be fired or what? sacked out. Right, fired. You would say, yeah, for from that uh, TV Job. program by Ronald Trump. Fired, right? It was very, yeah. <laughs> it was very popular. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. You now, remember him? I've never heard of this one. Have you heard of this one? But to be sacked is yeah. very common. Uh, we never say that. To Maybe. get no, to get the sack or to be sacked are yeah. the, the two that yeah. I. I think the origin or the idea is that you get your back, and you. Mm. Go home, oh. maybe crying a little, <laughs> going home. I've with been sacked with your possessions and all that. Mm -hmm. And now uh, the elephant in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, okay? No, I, I meant we're going to Esparraguera oh, yeah. with Umberto. Yes. Was it uh, fun? Yes, it was fun yeah. because um, I wanted to find out more about these uh, words that you have for each other between the city people and the countryside people here in, uh, in Catalonia. And I already knew a few of them, but uh, what, I, what surprised me, because I thought it was just between Barcelona and the countryside, but what surprised me is that there are some between the country oh, yeah. people as oh, well. Really? Yeah. Uh, so there's a little bit of rivalry between Asper Esparraguera and Olesa. Oh yeah. And I absolutely. was thrown into that sack. <laughs> okay. Let's take a beat. And does it have anything to do with your hat? No, this is not, normally not my cowboy hat. This is more of an outback hat from Australia. So okay. we don't wear this in the as a cowboy. You don't wear this. This is more outback. But uh, I left my hat. Uh, somewhere that I couldn't uh, bring it with me, so I borrowed this one, and I did look a little bit. I don't know if you noticed, like Howdy, uh, no, uh, Woody, Woody from Toy Story. Did you <laughs> see that? Yes. Uh, oh, yeah. you will see that now again. But uh, but anyway, so we actually, ha I do have one that's a little bit more American, oh. and that's this ball cap. It's called a ball cap oh. because it comes from baseball, yeah. and uh, we call it not just a hat, but a ball cap, and then short for cap. So I, I'm switching hats today. Oh, really? Really? Well, the idiom that we used last time we had the show. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. using two hats, that's yeah, exactly, it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, let's take a peek. <laughs> okay, let's do that. In America, there's a little rivalry between the city slickers, as we call them, and the country bumpkins like me, all the time, y'all. And we are about to find out how they deal with that in Catalonia here in Esparraguera. What do the Catalans call the people from the city? Bishabins. <laughs> people that pee on pines, y'all. Domingueros, urbanitas. The kemaku. Because when they arrive in, in a village, uh, all is all oh, kamaku, kamaku. How beautiful, right? Yeah. Now I'm going to show you all why it's better to be in the country. Maybe they think that we are from another... Another world? Planet, another world. They don't respect uh, the forest. It's more selfish, maybe. Sometimes they're little, you know, looking from... Above! Uh, up, yes. No? Tell me what the stereotypes of the people in the village are. Maybe that we don't have a privacy. Always there are eyes uh, looking. What are you doing? Who is that girl? No, it's only my friend. <laughs> but yes, uh, the rumors. Maybe after your mother, your friend say, ah, somebody see you. Uh. Translation, ladies and gentlemen, if you fart, everybody knows. Exactly. <laughs> I think it's about time we make Catalan country music a trend here now. Have you heard this country song? Pero si no llavors, de Barcelona. I don't like it, so I don't care. 
Great song. That was me, y'all. I've just discovered here, ladies and gentlemen, there must be a rivalry between Olesa and Esparraguera. Is that correct? Yes, the young people, men came here to dance with us. With the women? The girls, yes. It's all about love, ladies and gentlemen. My father uh, went to Olesa to find my mother. <gasps> Scandal. Terrassa, mala raça. Terrassa, bad race. Sabadell, mala pell. Sabadell, bad skin. Olesa, són dimonis. Olesa, they're demons. I Esparraguera, bona gent. And of course, Esparraguera is good people. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get down to the skinny. Who has the better men? Esparraguera or Olesa? Esparraguera, for course, of course. I want to see your husband. We have a big theater here, La Passió. And there are another big theater in Olesa, La Passió. The best uh, is our Passió. I kill Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. This is very country right here. This is the Montserrat Mountain. If I put Montserrat in my arm, I can travel, I can be far away or in another country. And but you'll, you'll always be near it. This is uh, uh, the, the song of the Madonna. In your name begin our history, and is Montserrat our Sinai. You cannot get any more country than this. And I am going to take this arm with me wherever I go. Come on, boy. <laughs> The rivalry here, ladies and gentlemen, seems to rival the rivalry in the United States, except that they don't have country music here. We don't have Montserrat. And the arm of that last guy. Can I just say that I found the passion in Sparagera, as the passion of Sparagera, in the shape of that Roman soldier. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, okay. okay, we noticed that. It was great. What did you think of that uh, singer? <laughs> that singer, I don't know. He uh, he looks like Umberto. No? Yeah, words fail me. I, I, <laughs> he didn't recognize me. I loved it because you know the mask just covers everything yeah. these days. Okay, so we didn't know you had this hidden talents. I didn't know you were a singer as well. Well, yeah, I have a little bit of an album coming out, but you know what? You give me a little bit of cava, and I sing, I talk, I do anything. <laughs> Corpina. <nuts>. Okay, <laughs> good one. Exactly. Yeah, even better. This is my first time doing um, Catalan country. And okay, and you turned into a country bumpkin? Uh, yes, I turned into a redneck, hick, country bumpkin, all three of those. <laughs> it's good. Let me explain a little bit about bumpkin. I don't know if you guys know the word bumpkin is yeah. derogatory originally. It goes to um, uh, say that somebody is uh, awkward and unsophisticated. Mm. And so the city... The pumpkin. Yes, bumpkin. But the city slickers would always talk uh, bad about the country people seeing, saying they're not educated, they don't have a passport, they never travel, and so on. And what I really like about the country people is that they've taken every hit from the city people and they turned it into uh, something positive. So they said, okay, you call us Bumpkin? We're gonna go ahead and call ourselves bump Bumpkin and do it, with, do it with pride. Then they called them rednecks and they said, okay, we'll take Redneck and we'll do it with pride. <laughs> and uh, they are so, so humble uh, with everything. Love them. That, that, that's the, the, the same thing with Pichapins, Camaco, and all that words that uh, they told you that they are using uh, as a positive thing. Yes. Or in, in an ironical yeah. uh, good way. Some of them tell you that a lot of people outside Barcelona their word for Barcelona is canfanga. Yeah. House of the mud. Yes. I heard that that's usually for the woman and that for the man it was pisha pains because the woman had to <laughs> pull up her dress to go through uh, mud, mud. Yeah. and she would still come out muddy. That's what I heard. I never heard this. Yeah, this story yeah but that, that was on the, on the central streets in Barcelona, in the very good houses. They got a sort of metallic piece so that you could clean your yes. shoes because of the mud mm, okay. on the road, right? There, there are still some of those left in stitches. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amazing. <laughs> That's a good point. And I think now it's time to solve last week's guess word with, uh, with Marius. Uh, so uh, the clue for last week was? Yeah, remember that. He's quite happy today. <laughs> Glass is up to talk about bread. Glass is up to talk about bread. It was a five letter word. Any idea? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, what do you have you for breakfast? Uh, I don't know, this one. Throw me a bone. <laughs> what do you have for toast. breakfast? It's oh, toast. Uh, toast. toast. A piece a of toast. 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 Yeah. yeah. A toast is a call to raise glasses. 
oh, let's make a toast to the honor of people. But it uh, uh, also means bread round, right? Yeah. But curiously, both meanings are related because when uh, you uh, used to be mm, to, to have a toast, uh, your liquid was quite accompanied by adding a spiced toast to them Seriously? with bread. Right. A spiced toast, meaning yeah, like spiced. Sp spicy hot? Yeah, hot. Okay. Yeah. Right? Wow. So that you just eat a little and drink. Wow. Like with tequila. I did not know that. <laughs> I, didn't know I didn't know that, know that either. I, I, know, I know in Poland when they make toasts with vodka, they immediately eat a little bit of brown bread afterwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, but it's not toasted. So I don't uh, and yeah. but in it's other places brown. it's bread and a bit of salt. Ah, there so, you go. Yeah, anyway, what about today's uh, okay. Enigma, Marius? Uh, let's see if it's quite easy, I think. To stroll with a Chinese pen. Four letters. To stroll with a Chinese pen. Four letters. That's a short word you can find and post your solution to the guess word on our social media profiles. Well, Matthew, Marius, Umberto, thank you. Until next time and, uh, well, thank you. next time more stories, right? Okay. Okay. Bye. Today we're going to hear firsthand the story of the woman who broke the glass ceiling in sports management in Catalonia. Don't miss our chat with Maria Tashido. And we continue with a couple of proposals to help boost your English. Two classics to choose from, a novel which revolutionized science fiction and then a comedy film. These are the recommendations with uh, Miquel Lopez from Televisió de Badalona and Salvador Faura from the Xarxa de Bibliotecas Municipals of the Diputació de Barcelona. The War of the Worlds is famous for two reasons. First, because Wells wrote the first text, or among the first texts, to deal with an alien invasion of our planet. And all the circumstances that occur in this book are later repeated in books and films and video games. And the second reason is for social psychologists. And that is because uh, somebody was reading the, a chapter of this book on the radio, and the people listening to it thought that what was being read was actually happening for real, and this caused havoc in Great Britain. Read it, it's really worth it. One of the first genius in cinema history was Charles Chaplin. He developed a character, the Trump, that was an icon in silent movies. In fact, he played this character even when the sound was well established in the cinema. The Great Dictator was the first time that Chaplin and his tram talked. And boy, did he talk. In fact, he plays two characters, his usual one, a Jewish barber in the ghetto, and the dictator of the country, a clear parody of Adolf Hitler. In the end, the barber, mistaken for the dictator, delivers a long and memorable speech about peace and freedom. Charles Chaplin directed, produced, wrote, scored, and starred in this movie, made sure to have a role for his then-wife, Paulette Godard, and also actor Jack Oeke plays another dictator, very, very similar to Benito Mussolini. Welcome back. Art has been proven to be one of the most useful forms of non-verbal expression for accessing and understanding our subconscious. That's why it's such a great tool to help people who have trouble expressing themselves verbally. And coming up next is a portrait of Jenna Mann, an art therapist currently living in Barcelona. Hi, my name is Jenna Mann and I'm from New York and I am an art therapist. I originally, I moved from New York to Madrid and I lived in Madrid for a couple of years and then I decided to study art therapy and I moved to Barcelona and my plan was not to stay here, I was going to study someplace else. Art therapy, uh, it uses art as a tool 
Um, so regular therapy, usually people are just, they sit with a therapist and they talk. And with art, it's a way of expressing yourself. Um, and I believe that it really accesses unconscious uh, stuff in a very, almost like dreams. So when you're sitting and talking with someone, it's difficult to kind of access the things that maybe you're not so aware of. And art really helps to get to know oneself and get access to all those things that, you know, not, might not be present in the moment. I decided to study art therapy because uh, basically my whole life I've, I've studied photography and I've been a photographer um, and I've also been very interested in psychology. Uh, so art therapy really is a way to bridge those two. Art therapy is not for every single person, but I do, I would say to those kinds of people, well, yes, you are artistic. There is an artistic place inside of you. With everyone, whether they're kids or adults, I, I really enjoy making a connection with someone. Like I, I think there are different ways, obviously with children versus adults, I think with children, um, I like that they're so pure and they're kind of like, they don't have any filters. So even older kids, like the way that things come out so naturally, I think there's a couple things I, I find here and just in talking to other people from other countries that here, there's a lot of stigma with therapy. Like, uh, I don't think, I feel like mental health is not so much of a priority in general here. Um, so almost art is more respected than anything therapeutic. So I, th I feel like saying art therapist, there's like an immediate rejection. I think we're conditioned to say, oh, you're good at this, you're bad at that in school, they teach us who is an artist and who isn't? And I really think we're all artists in some way or another. Our next guest today uh, has been a huge fan of the football club uh, Barcelona since her father first took her to the Camp Nou, but as a member of the club, she always wondered why women weren't more represented. Well, many years later, she became vice president of Barca's foundation and the first woman to serve as secretary to the club's board of uh, directors. Her name is Maria Tachido. Welcome, Maria, to the Weekly Mag. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Okay, Maria, um, you're currently a businesswoman and a lawyer. You occupy managing positions uh, in companies. And I think I'm not exaggerating if I'm saying that you're leading the way for future generations of women. So um, how do you see uh, the role of women in the business world today? Um, I think our duty a bit is to, as you said, just lead future generations and, and show ourselves as uh, women that have, I mean, we have studied, we have done many things and uh, we have reached top positions and that's fine. I mean, that's fine for young girls to dream of. And I think that's, um, that's about telling them uh, that they are allowed into this world and they can, they can of course work for it and, and uh, they deserve any dream they can have. Um, Maria, uh, like we said, you're a lawyer and a businesswoman. Um, what projects are you involved in at the moment? So I'm, um, I'm a lawyer in intellectual property, which I have always been uh, in the last 20 years. And I'm also involved in two projects uh, that have to do with uh, legal tech, so adapting technology to law processes. Uh, one of them has to do with, um, with uh, ethic lines or help buttons uh, that uh, are in form of apps. Uh, one uh, focused on uh, schools, it's called Be Resort, um, helping kids to denounce any uh, harassment situations such as bullying, cyberbullying, yes. or eating disorders which also um, are discovered by, by our system. 
Um, the other one is going to the corporate world. Uh, it's called Cobrizo, and it it sort of also aims to uh, tackle harassment in the business, in the corporate world, or the business industry. Um, and then I'm also involved in a compliance management tool that we are building just to tackle how um, companies evaluate their risks of committing um, crimes or, or illegal, illegal um, um, whatever situations and uh, how they can adapt their decision making process to some sort of uh, legal path. Well, that's impressive. That's a long list of things that you're doing <laughs> every day. When do you have time for all these activities? Because you're also a mother. I'm a mother of two, you have two wonderful girls. Yeah. Um, and as I have always said, I think that uh, when it comes to equality and what we women need, uh, things uh, are start at home. So we need to have a partner that also is there for what matters, which is bringing up your kids and. Uh, and managing this, the current situation, so um, so that's that's the starting point. And both your partner and uh, the family around, because that's a, that's a big net of people helping always, uh, need to do their part so that everyone can thrive in life. Which I think that's what this is about. Mm -hmm. Well, and you, um, li like we said to you, you've been very successful, you made history at Barca, but um, uh, not just uh, uh, in Barca, you've occupied many important positions in, in the cultural uh, companies, in startups, uh, and all the companies that you mentioned before. So when you were 10 years old, and your father used to take you to watch football games, would you have thought? Uh, would you have imagined that you would uh, achieve so many things and you would uh, get to be one of the, the important names uh, in Barca? Not at 10 years <laughs> old, I think. I was not thinking about this. And, um, but yes, I mean, come now is so impressive. And you know, it's like being there and, and, and all you have lived in, in that stadium is, is like huge. So, when the time comes for you to decide if you're going to accept a position in there or the option of a position in there because you have to run an election and things like that. Um, and it's exciting to look back and, and think of your younger self just being there watching the match and, and, and suddenly um, being able to serve the club and then what's what the club is making now and, and to change things in, in the world, which I think that's an important legacy that Barca is leaving to society. Um, okay, well, uh, as, a, as a symbol, as a manager at, at football and uh, uh, working with uh, women's sports, uh, do you think uh, that for future generations, for, for, for young girls and women, uh, do, they, do you think they need role models in order to, to, uh, you know, to find inspiration and to, to help them achieve their own goals? Absolutely. I think this is uh, very, very important. Um, we need to focus on, on extraordinary women that are doing extraordinary things in all fields. And we need to show this, not only for girls, but also for boys. I think that's very important to normalize the fact that when you're uh, talking about a cook, it's not only a man or a doctor, it's not only a man. So we need to see diversity everywhere. And since the world is so unbalanced towards men, I think we need now to just pull women and, and put them in the, in the front row so that everyone can see that they are also achieving great things. In your case, uh, which women inspired you? I mean, uh, do you have any role models? Uh, do, do you have any specific names of, of women in any field that inspired you? I think a lot. I mean, I used to read lots of books from Agatha Christie. So I thought she, her, her life uh, itself was exciting. It's loud about exploring and then uh, writing these extraordinary novels. Um, but also uh, TV characters are Spippi Langstrom when we were kids. That was yeah. exciting to see. <laughs> wow, wow this, she's different and she's... I'm a fan as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Mafalda also was a story that I read a lot and, and, and that inspired me. And uh, more recently, I think we have very good examples in Michelle Obama or Jacinta Ardern. Um, the world is full of wonderful women we can uh, learn from.
okay. And we can't ignore, uh, and this interview we can't ignore feminism, the feminist uh, movement. So do you think, uh, what is feminism for you and do you think it is a, a good way to define uh, equality between uh, genders? I like this definition, uh, I think it's Mary Sheem uh, that said um, feminism is like the, the, the revolutionary idea, idea that a woman uh, is people, so that women are also included in, in what we think that people are. No? So, um, so uh, it's, it's, I think it's a tool that we need to adopt to see the world in, the, in its entirety. I mean, societies are half men, half women, um, and uh, biologically that's, that's what it is. And then, and then within that, there's so much diversity. Um, we cannot see the world through one single lens. Um, so feminism is something uh, that is that is, has been sometimes seen as uh, hating men or being against, and I think that's the wrong way to focus on that term, which uh, on the contrary means uh, inclusion. It means um, seeing the world as a whole thing, as a system that uh, includes everyone. So it's more about cooperation, collaboration, um, summing up, adding up, and building together what, what needs to be a society that, that is there for every one of us. As the first woman to become vice president of the foundation and also as uh, secretary of the, of the board at, uh, at Barca, um, do you find, I mean from your experience, that uh, discrimination is more frequent in sport or in football more than in other sports? Well, I think and I've always said that um, this is like cultural context we are in, so any industries or most of the industries do have this bias. Mm -hmm. So um, particularly in, in sports, um, the things have been, I mean, how history has built sports and, and professional sports and elite sports has been around uh, focusing, on, focusing on men and, and, and their capacity to put their bodies at the limit and we have built like heroes and we have uh, dedicated lots of public investment in that and, and showing them on, on public TV and then building these huge markets that now make the whole history go round. Everything um, focusing on men. Right? Yeah, so that, that's, that, that's the starting point for me, you know, from that time when uh, women were supposed not to be able to practice sports because it was, it would harm their bodies um, or, or And whatever. then here in Spain it, it became illegal, no? In a period of time as well. Yeah, so. and when we've seen that we were not allowed to vote, we were not allowed to hold like bank accounts, we needed authorization for whatever we wanted to do not so long ago, so... Um, so you wouldn't say that there is maybe more discrimination in football than in other sports? I would say that, that there is discrimination of course and we are, I mean in the last years we've started to see women uh, on stage but as, as we said before it's like um, we saw this, this, this uh, Ballon d'Or to Ada where she was asked about can, if she could twerk instead yeah, of asking exactly. her what, what, their, what, what her success was in the, in the football field. Which was very unfortunate. Yeah, or we have the American uh, national selection that is be being paid less than the men's one, even though they are the ones winning all the medals, which also happens in, in, in the Olympics, uh, where we have you know, more women medalists than men, but still we just hear about them and we remember their names, but not the woman's or it was reminded now when, when Rafa Nadal, who is an extraordinary player, uh, won uh, his Grand Slam and it was like put in the news. But I mean, there are more women with more Grand Slams than them and we don't know their names or we don't necessarily remind their names. We don't read really so much about them in the, in the media. Exactly. So I think that's, that's a duty of, of the whole society and we, we were talking previously, we need to see this as a whole and, and not just focus and, and concentrate in one particular side of the That's story. That's totally true. Okay, um, um, as a member of the, of the um, uh, of Barca's uh, uh, directive board, you uh, had a lot of interest and you worked with the, the women's team. So, um, what are you most uh, proud of? When you think of that period, I know you you enjoyed it a lot. A lot. Um, <laughs> which are the things that you're most proud of? related to, to uh, women's football? 
Um, I think it was like a, a very special moment was, was when we won uh, the semi-finals and that gave us the opportunity to go to Budapest, our first uh, final, which was something that happened much before what we had predicted. So this sort of suddenly said, wow, if, if we really invest in them, if we really provide uh, for the same tools and allow them to just blossom, they do. So we have not experienced it, um, as much as we have done with man, what's the return? Yeah. And, um, and uh, this was the very, the, the, the perfect example when, you know, saying, we just gave them the opportunity to be professional in what they are best at. We gave Do you think that if, if maybe um, uh, the same in, uh, investment and the same effort would have been put into women, uh, uh, in women's football as much as in men's football? I mean, do you think uh, the results would have been different? Do you think they could compete oh. uh, in equal uh, opportunity and have maybe uh, the same results? Because I think once you said that for you the ideal, um, in, an, in an ideal world, you would have mixed teams. Yes. Men and Women. Absolutely, absolutely. I think we, we we have not tested it. I mean, we cannot say it's like wh why is it that we, we have to have tried. separate yep. uh, teams and separate competitions? How comes? I mean, of course we, we are not there already because but but because we lack the experience. We have not been training for years and years, and we have not studied uh, the woman's body as much as we have done with the man's. Um, we need doctors specializing in, in this, we need uh, nutritionists to be focused on what a woman's body is capable of giving if, if treated properly. So that's what I mean, if, if we really invest in them and, and they, they show what they are capable of, we, we will find extraordinary results as the one we, we saw with Boston, which was an extraordinary moment for all of yes, us. Yes, exactly, I'm sure of that. Well. Well, this is a fascinating topic which we'll go on talking about very soon, but that will be after our first language tip. Among the many words borrowed by English from different languages, there are some Arabic terms. Well, let's learn four of the most common ones with our teacher, Mark Broderick. Hey! So we couldn't continue our tip section without, of course, saying that there are words that we do loan from Arabic, funnily enough, all right? Now, there aren't as many Arabic words in English as you might think, but here's a couple to get you started. Sherbet, which I found out was Arabic recently. And sherbet, of course, if any of you are from the British Isles or Ireland, will know it is that wonderful powder that you stick a lollipop in and put it in your mouth. And it has that tingling taste on your tongue. You can also mix it with water. However, in fact, sherbet comes from the Arabic word, which means like a frozen dessert. All right? Funny one. Assassin. Assassin, of course, is a false friend. Be careful here. Because what an assassin actually is in English is a person who's contracted for killing somebody for political or religious reasons. If you wanted to say assassino, you would say a killer or a murderer. So be careful with that one. Then, in Asia, if any of you have ever traveled to Asia, you will know that they have a season called monsoon season. And monsoon season is when there's lots of rain and wind from the south, okay? So don't travel to places like Thailand, Vietnam, and Laos during monsoon season, or you will be sure to get extremely wet. Last one we have is a souk. A souk is an outdoor market in Arabic countries and North Africa. It also has the word Zouk with a Z, not with an S in Arabic. We have a similar word, which is bazaar, which comes from Persian, in fact, and is used quite often in Iran and other places in the Middle East. So be sure not to confuse bazaar with bizarre, which of course is something strange. Have a good one. Was I just not this just another lips to add to the list Do you know previous? If you do, you know how well they sound Its singer will be playing live on our stage in a few minutes on the Wiggly Mag
Welcome back. Here we are again with Marieta Shido, the trailblazing businesswoman who has achieved a successful career in sports management. And joining us now in our studio is the journalist and English commentator for Barca TV, Barney Griffiths, to talk about women in football. Well, Barney, hello. Hello, Welcome. Marcella. Thank you for having me. And hello, Maria. Hi. It's nice to be here. Yes, although football is the most popular sport in Spain, Women's football doesn't yet have a large following. Women were known to be playing football in this country since the first decade of the last century, but they were forbidden from playing the game from the 1930s to 1975, and they did not have a national league until 1988. However, in 2019, the Spanish FA committed itself to spending 20 million euros on the, the women's game. Wow. Barney, and if I may ask, how many uh, national competitions are there? So in the women's game, there are currently two national competitions. There's La Liga and La Copa de la Reina. Barca are the current league champions. Um, but uh, when it comes to the cup, they actually lost last year to Atletico in the semi-final, 2-0. Uh, but they did reach the final of the Women's Champions League last year, where they lost to the French club Lyon 4-1. Maybe we'll be discussing that later, mm -hmm. Maria. Um, I have some questions for Maria about women's football, since I know this was one of her main interests as a board member of the club and now as a Barca member. So I'm wondering, uh, Maria, how many people watched Barca women's football prior to COVID on a regular basis? And how do you think the women's game can actually grow uh, aside from the one-off flagship games that do attract very huge crowds? So, um, there was a difference for Barca when we built the Johan Cruyff sta Stadium. First, I mean, before that, we, we usually played in the Ciudad Esportiva. Um, so, we, we were in field number seven, which I mean, it, it allows a, a nice amount of spectators, but like the average was 500 people. Mm -hmm. um, our average spectator uh, mixing those moments with the games or matches we played in uh, the mini study, which was bigger, of course, made an average of 1,200 during the year. But once we opened the Johan Cruyff Stadium, uh, the average went rise up to 3,000. Which is great, which means that we have been able to build as a club um, these attendance, these spectators and, and as, a, as a Barca movement, a, a family fan uh, moment, which I think that's great. Uh, are, there, are there any ways, any specific ways in which Barca try to attract girls to, the, to, to, foot, to women's football at a young age? Um, in terms of, of attendance to the... No, in terms of playing the game. In terms of, of playing, I mean, we're, of course, um, uh, a grassroots club, so we need to have these, these uh, young teams and we, of course, have uh, lots of people looking for good players to train with us. Um, so it has been about building the professional team, but also making sure that we have all the teams from the very uh, young ages to the top so that we warranty that we just train women in the boss style and they can reach the top uh, by just knowing the game naturally. Right. Now, in the women's game, Barca's biggest rivals recently, in recent times, have been Atletico yeah. and Athletic Bilbao as well. Is there any reason why Real Madrid are not bigger in women's football, do you know of? Well, they, they just entered last season into this world and I think that's something to welcome because at the end um, El Clásico in the men's side is something that attracts audiences worldwide. And we need to stick to that, those things to just, you know, uh, make the women's uh, football grow also. So it's important for us that Real Madrid also plays his part here. And I think that um, that's something that I've been thinking a lot about. And, and, and you know that when you play the Champions League as a men's club, you need to have this young team. Otherwise, you can't enter the competition. Um, we should do the same with women. I mean, have if a youth, you want... A youth team. You, the youth team, yeah. yeah. So if this is like one of the, of the compulsory things to have 
if you want to go to the European competition, it should be the same with women. So I don't know why they didn't do it uh, earlier. Yeah, I'm, um, I, was, I was wondering myself why they didn't <laughs> We do have it. a long tradition in Barca. I mean, the first team that played was uh, 50 years ago, and then this year, it's, it's, in Christmas, it would be the celebration of this, of this first match at Camp Nou. Um, so um, I'm happy to see that they are following the leader. <laughs> well, have you ever played yourself? No. <laughs> I went to a school where football was forbidden at all, both for boys and girls. So really? We, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so no, we played basketball, we played uh, volleyball, but no okay. football allowed. But I, I don't know, but I was just wondering, uh, why isn't uh, women's football more popular here in Catalonia and Spain? And I was wondering, what's the situation of women's football in Spain compared to other countries? And if we still have a long way to go? Um, the number of licenses for girls has increased uh, in, a, in a very rapid way in the last uh, five years, I think. And I think it has to do with the fact that we have been uh, broadcasting more games, more matches, and we have been yeah. focusing, the medias have been doing that, and, and that's super important. Um, uh, in a survey like uh, two years ago that asked uh, kids uh, in their uh, teenagers, in, uh, what they wanted to become when they were uh, grown-ups, a uh, football player was in the top five for girls, which was an extraordinary um, uh, measure of, of what has been done in terms of really uh, providing for a future in this field, like saying you're also allowed to build a career in sports and in football. Yeah. So I think we're, we're in the right track. I hope the COVID thing doesn't bring this uh, back to some, you know, times we need to overcome. Right. Now, the, the men's game is economically super powerful, very powerful. We know that in economic terms. Are you fearful of, in the women's game, the English Premier League buying up all the best players like they've done a lot in the men's game? It's an economic thing when you get to that elite uh, sports. And of course, it's economics playing their part in, in, in the thing. So um, I need, we need to just rethink how we are going to build this. Uh, I would love women's football to be built in a sustainable way. Uh, because if you take all the players to England because they can play, pay better wages, um, then you're, you're just, you know, you're, you're... It's an imbalance, isn't yeah, it? It's an imbalance and, and, and you won't have a European yeah. competition that's worth seeing it. And, and we need, I think that's what Americans have built very, very well, like ensuring that each club in playing a league has, you know, a balanced number of players well, that the can... The draft system works yeah, very well, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, that, that, that works. Yeah. So we should look at this to sort of, and I'm not going to say we, we import it the same way, but, you know, there's things we can learn from, the, from this um, building of the clubs. Yeah. Right, okay. Now, I have a few questions for you from women football fans that I know. Uh, the first one is about the rules of the game. So the rules of women's football are actually the same as the men's game. But I'm wondering if you, well, this, this, I've been asked to ask you if, if you think there, if there should be some differences between the women's and the men's game. No, and I... I... Before, I'll give you an instance, I'll give you an instance. I know that I knew that your answer would be no straight away, but I'll give you an instance. In the British media recently, there's talk about having smaller goals, like making, making the goals smaller, because there's often a lot more goals in women's football as well. But you're going to say no. No. <laughs> no, and, and, and when you talk with players, they, 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 they don't complain about anything, so why should we? I mean, it's about what we were talking earlier. It's about providing for them to be like the best players they can be. And um, I'm sure that, that the goal will, will feel smaller in a year's time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I think we uh, are about to conclude this interview. We only have uh, time for one more question, Barney. I think I'll go for the, 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 the last one that I was asked to ask you, which is about Barca. Uh, they have a great squad this year. So they've got to be aiming to win their first Champions League, but how do they get past Lyon? <laughs> Lyon, of course, beat them in last year's final in a very strong French team. Training, training and training. I mean... Do you give them a chance? Yeah, yes. And I think that the evolution that we've seen in the last years shows that we are capable. I mean, we, we thought we were like 
very far from them. Um, but um, the, the, the thing is you need to, to train, you need to have national competitions that are strong enough so that each match is a training for that championship. And uh, things that we are, uh, well, Barca is, is, is doing, like, you know, playing against men's squads, men's teams, uh, youth teams, of course, but um, that allows you to just, you know, evolve and, and of course, uh, match Leon, which is not that far away. Well, fingers crossed for Barca <laughs> this season, women's team. Yes. Okay, well, uh, let's conclude this conversation with a surprise question, not from us, but from our last guest, uh, the soundtrack composer and conductor, Marc Timon. And uh, this is the question chain for you, Maria. Let's have a look, okay? My name is Marc Timon. I'm a composer and orchestra conductor. And my question is, why we pay so much attention to fit our body, our physical body, and why we forget so much about uh, feeding our soul? Well, I think that, that first, feeding our body is not, is not fit, I mean, it's also feeding our soul. I, I love to eat beautiful dishes. Mm -hmm. I love it when, when you got this food served, which is artistic. And, um, and I think that we are also feeding our souls by, and I think we've done this a lot in, in the pandemics, by reading, listening to music. I mean, music has been there to help us um, not survive this moment and reminding us that, that there's always a way to cope with the situation, even if it's a bad one. Um, it's very important to, to sing, to dance, to, to find these moments, even if it's on your own at home and uh, I've been singing a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's good? Yeah, on my own. But <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and Maria, uh, uh, before we go, as a woman of many projects, uh, like you said, we, mm, this interview was about this, about uh, yourself uh, as, a, as a woman on the board of, uh, of uh, Barcelona, Football Club Barcelona, also you all um, were briefly uh, the president of the Circuit de Montmeló. Mm -hmm. uh, so what are your next challenges and uh, your next projects? Uh, first challenge is to survive the pandemics. <laughs> I think that's a common I one. I think we all have yeah. that in common, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I want to still focus on, on, this, on this equal thing. I mean, I have two girls um, growing up them in, in a way that, I mean, they need to know that the world is there for, for them too um, and need to help them um, thrive as, as we think we need to, to do with everyone. I mean, um, I am totally focused on, on building this, this more inclusive society we need. Perhaps this family time that we're spending more of necessarily is yeah. giving us a message that we should be spending that time educating our children a bit more rather than letting the technology or the internet educate them. Exactly. Perhaps. More conversations, more meaningful conversations exactly. yeah. and things around, that help. Maybe around the dinner table feeding our, our, our bodies and our souls. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's, that's a good point. Well, thank you, Maria, so much for coming to you. and sharing uh, your experience uh, and um, stories with us uh, today. And good luck with uh, all your projects. Thank you, Barney. Thanks and uh, until next time. See you next time. A mix of folk, indie and pop, sometimes a little bit of reggae. This is Pribit, or in other words, uh, Ander and Alan Pribitschuk. These two brothers from Capalladas created the Pribit band in uh, 2010. And in 2016, they won the artsy sponsorships, which allowed them to release their first album called Carousel. And today we are talking to the singer of the band, Ander Pribitschuk. Hello, Ander. Hello. A pleasure to have you here. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, first of all, this surname, I hope I pronounced it correctly. Yeah. Where does it come from? <laughs> <laughs> we I mentioned Capalladas, but I think we need to go to Russia yeah. and also Paraguay, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, well, I was born in Paraguay, but, but uh, my surname comes from Russia, Ukraine, something like that. I'm, I'm not 100% sure how it goes, but yeah, my grandparents had to move from from the country and they went to South America and that's why my surname is is kind of misspelled it's it's a, right. it's a little bit different so you don't speak russian i, can, I take no, it no at all <laughs> yeah, i got lost in the way okay we uh, we said that um, your first uh, album uh, carousel 
Okay, <clears throat> was released in 2016, yeah. but he actually started playing uh, six years, years before in 2010. What happened in these uh, in between, and what was the turning point in your career, which uh, which led you, which uh, allowed you to uh, to create to do this uh, album? Uh, well. We say that officially we started in 2010, but uh, it's, I, don't, I don't know if the first two years there were many gigs or anything, so okay. I guess it started a little bit later. But um, yeah, I guess we, I just started to do it for fun. I, 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 I've always liked music. I've always, I, I always sang in, in, in my house uh, around with the, with the radio, with the volume turned up very loud and everything and then at some point I, I started my best friend gave me my first guitar and well he he lent me and then okay. I, I I I fell in love with the guitar I started to play other people's songs and then I, at some point I got tired I started to write my own things and it, it just kept going I just did one gig and then in that gig someone told us hey you need to come to play next week on my place mm -hmm. and it just went okay. like that yeah and, and you decided to apply for a sponsorship and this uh, was actually really important in your career, right? Yeah, yeah. We've we, we never been like big fans of like contests and those kind of things because it, it sounds a little bit strange to have a contest with music. Uh, but uh, yeah, our manager at the time, uh, he told us that we should try this one because it looks very nice. And luckily we, we won that one. Yeah. And, and we were very lucky because it, it paid everything. We, 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 we got the chance to, to record in a really nice studio and it was, it was a very nice experience. Okay, so your, uh, the, the release of your, of your album was, was for you uh, uh, before and after, obviously. Um, that was uh, in 2016. Uh, what happened after that? After that, many changes. Uh, we started, we did a few gigs that were very big and very nice and then at some point I kind of got lost in my own brain and I had to give it a little bit of space to to understand what was going on because it was a little bit of a like a shock when you because I, I was I was born in the 90 in, in 90 uh, 1990 and uh, then you were like okay when I get my first album it's gonna be anything you know just fame from from okay. there on and so I had to like accept that situation of the whole industry of music was changing and I was like, okay, it's not, it's not exactly like you imagine, you have to evolve and, and, and adapt to, to the new industry. Mm -hmm. So I had to take this a little bit of, a little bit of time to, to yeah. understand the whole situation. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been to important festivals. I have here written down Kruilla, Proxy, Fora Muralla, but obviously now with the whole pandemic situation, this is not possible. Uh, anymore? How do you feel? Um, how do you feel that things are right now? I mean, uh, the musical industry is, is suffering a lot. Uh, how's, how does it feel for you? I think most people, especially like small bands like mine, we're probably struggling a lot mentally and probably financially too. Uh, I guess some other people are luckier and they get more projects and they get involved in more projects. Uh, but right now, I think for the for the regular bands, it's it's kind of tough because one it or not, what feeds us both financially and emotionally, it's the contact with people, being in front of yes. people and interacting with them. That's what makes us. I mean, I mean, I think at least 99% of the people who, who create music. The only reason they do it is because they like that connection with people. Yes. Maybe to, to explore your, your feelings and everything, but mostly that. And I think most of us are struggling because we yeah. miss that, that yeah. energy with people a lot. But at least one good thing about the pandemic is that you had more time to compose. Yes, yeah. the, the virus and the whole situation uh, has somehow affected the, the style or the tone of your, of your music. I, st I started to change the style because in, in this first album, Carousel, when you, when you listen to this, a mixture of, there, there's many different colors. There are super happy songs and then super intimate songs. And I guess at the point that I was changing my mindset about everything, I started to tone it a little bit more down and it, everything turned a little bit more intimate. 
but with with the with COVID, it turned totally dark. So it's, <laughs> now it's it's not dark. It's it's I'm just. Uh, ex experimenting with new colors and everything, you won't find songs like like DeLorean or Be Mine that are in the last song. But yeah, it, it, and it also changed my my way to, of of writing the songs. Now, I I already started changing some topics that I that I talked about. But nowadays, it's very easy to have uh, the whole situation, life, death, and 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 our the connection between people. It's it's very present in, in, in my mind right now, so everything that I'm writing is kind of connected to that. Okay, well, let's, let's hope that this situation will not last uh, for a long time and then you'll be able to write heavier songs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, what are you going to sing for us today? I'm going to play a song called You Are Bad, which is not in the album. Okay, and again, that sounds a bit... Uh, Dark? Yeah, because th there's a little bit of a story behind you. I mean, to, to tell yes, the story. Yes, sir. What yeah. is the story behind uh, it? I, I, I told myself that I would stop writing love songs, or at least like just choosing one or two songs for the next album. So it's and a love song? It is a love song, but it's it's a different love song because okay. the, the name is uh, You're Bad. But then, when you get to the end, should I, should I give you the spoiler for the song, or...? or? Uh, yeah, we can tell the viewers uh, yeah. no, when you wrote it or what inspired you to write it. That's it's, the, yeah, is it a you, broken when, heart song? Yes, kind of. But when you, when you hear the song, y you will probably feel like I'm, I'm talking to someone else and I'm giving my perspective from, from, from their relationships or everything. Or anything and at the end you realize that it's actually things that have been said to me instead okay. of the other way around. Okay so it's actually based on your own experience. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Most right. of the time they are my experience. Right okay so we're looking forward to listening uh, to the song sounds good uh, we're going to listen to You Are Bad. Uh, thank you for coming Ander and hopefully you are uh, going to be able to go back to the to the stage with uh, the performances and gigs that uh, you are uh, looking for. And uh, anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. And good luck with all your projects. Thank you too. Any fun experiences related with doctors? We'll be hearing some strange stories in Guess What? Our quiz with Sergi Cervera.
feel Sorry for all the souls that you will steal I know you've always played with people's hope I wonder how many muses have you had this week I'll go through so many arms before I forget yours You're the most beautiful and painful scar that I ever have I gave you pieces of me and I don't want them back I'm still asking myself who hurt you so bad to turn you to the person who murdered love Cause every time Welcome back to the Weekly Mag, and now it's time for games with, guess what, and our quiz master, Sergio Cervera. Yes, with your help, Marcella. Hello, everybody. Here I come to challenge three contestants with another set of interesting rounds. Join us in our Weekly Quiz. But first, the introduction. Exactly. Today's guest uh, contestant is Cella Falgueras from Radio Televisio de Cardadeo and a contributor to this show. Chela, hello, how are you? Hi. Fine, thank you very much. Very glad to be here and uh, very happy for your invitation. So let's go for the show. Yeah, that's the attitude. <laughs> exactly, we are let's here go. Too. Let's go for it. Uh, Chela is a multifaceted businesswoman, social media strategist, online uh, marketing, and she also has her own radio show. That's quite a lot, Chela. What is it about? Uh, the radio show is called Buscar la Vida and it's about technology and entrepreneurship. So wow. it's a nice combination. I get to meet lots of interesting people and talk a lot about Amazon, Google and Mr. Zuckerberg and all that. Yeah, it's quite is interesting. Mm, definitely check good. it out. And together with us again, two brilliant contestants who have so many brains that they can afford to fry them a bit by participating here today. Miss Patricia Scalona and Mr. Matthew Murtha. How are you doing? Hello. Hi, hi. Hi, hi. <laughs> you look okay. excited, Patricia. As always. <laughs> so let's begin with our multiple choice round. One point for each right answer. And today we are going to hear some stories about health. And uh, do you remember that Norwegian guy whose talent was uh, moving his ears? It turns out this was not his biggest problem. <laughs> so there was this one time I fell from a really high place on the concrete and I got a concussion. So I had to go to the emergency room at the hospital. And the first thing I remember seeing was a clown that was there dancing and juggling. And I thought, what, is this real? So after this concussion, he sees a clown in the ER. What do you think the clown was actually? I'm gonna give you three options. A, it was just a real clown in the emergency room. B, he was his father, like I am your father, you know? And C, it was a doctor with a colored gown. <laughs> but because of the concussion, you know? So... What's your answer? Do you want to go tell us your... It was a doctor. It was a doctor. Yes. You went just straight forward. Yes. <laughs> I'm pretty sure uh, any clown in a, in a hospital is called a chiropractor. Am I right? <laughs> Am I? Oh my okay. God. No. no, I think it was a, a real clown. I think uh, real clown. he saw a real clown. If you ever watch them, they are in a, it's a very dangerous occupation. There's banana <laughs> peels. There's tiny little cars. I think it was a real clown and he was there with a significant injury. Damn, I laughed again. Patricia, yeah. how about you? I think... I I agree with Tella actually. I think it was probably just um, a doctor. Okay, I can see competition here. I like it. So here's the clown true identity. But then as I cleared up and woke up, it was actually a real clown. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, even clowns go to the hospital. Job well done, sir. So what's the strangest thing you've ever seen in a hospital or at the doctor's? Apart from a clown. A model, actually. A model? A model. <laughs> but how did you know that he was, or she was, was a model? I he was at the hospital. the hospital. <laughs> I was at the hospital. I was treated by this doctor who was actually really handsome. 
Okay. And then <laughs> so a handsome was. doctor and a model. Yeah, and then and you know when I was better, I started to think about him and his face, and I remembered, and I had seen him in ads because he was doing both modeling oh. and being oh, a doctor. So you, you were in the waiting room of the emergency room, checking out like, mm, okay, this guy. I've no, seen he came him. to treat me. I was in oh, excruciating pain. Oh, oh, okay, so you both were alone. Was and that then, here? Nice to know. And then next week you discovered your uh, whatever hurt again, and you went to. The doctor. <laughs> no, actually, he came to check on me the next day, but um, he, I had a boyfriend by then, and he was like, "Who is this man who's so like handsome?" And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> "Okay, I could keep commenting, but I think I'm gonna stop yeah, here." Yeah, we're gonna stop here. We need to take that number. Yeah, we need to find the number. And his doctor's number. Mm -hmm. Never, never. We'll find him. Okay, guys. So now let's meet Tom, who also suffered an injury. Listen, this guy. One day, I was playing football and uh, my friend kicked the ball very hard at my foot and uh, my ankle swelled up a lot. So uh, my dad's a doctor, so I called him. He said, ah, no problem, your ankle's going to be fine. All right, so his father wisely calmed him down right away. What was the final diagnosis? A, he had a broken ankle. B, his ankle <laughs> was sprained. See, he had nothing. The pain just went away in minutes, as his father said. I think that if you're going to check WebMD, it would say cancer. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Google would have said. However, this time... But it was his father. Yeah, his father, his father said that he was fine, but right. what did it happen? Real answer, A. It's a broken ankle. It's a broken sure ankle, it. not ankle. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Broken Show heart. Up. Same with me, and I would say he had the Achilles tendon broken. Okay. okay, so A. Are you, are a. you a doctor so as well? A. <laughs> it really no. looked like very scientific. Yeah, it was right. like she knows what she's talking about, damn. I think she's seen the x-rays. Yeah. I don't go for <laughs> the drama as much, so I'm going to say sprained. Sprained, like, yeah, the soft one. Yeah. You pick the soft, soft one. Soft landing, yeah. Okay, okay. You never played the soft uh, answer. We're going to check. Here are the results. Then I went to the hospital. Turns out I broke my ankle. Yay! So, Patricia, you never played soft. That's what it happened when you play soft. With people, Will. That is actually a reassuring doctor for you. I mean, like, a broken bone. Oh, boy, that's nothing. When I was young, we broke bones every day. You know, that's a reassuring doctor. <laughs> right, right, right? Am I right? No. But save me, on. Marcella. So, uh, I will save you with a question for them. Have Thank you ever you. had a broken bone? What yeah, happened? and I was in that situation. My teacher told me that's nothing, and I went home, and my my arm was completely crooked, and in fact, it's still crooked because it yes. didn't get properly fixed uh, for several reasons. So yes, that happened to me. That oh, leads to a terrible. conclusion: never listen to your teachers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and don't listen to Sadie. <laughs> don't always that's, listen that's to Sadie. <laughs> A good one, actually. All right, let's finish with a well-known witness. Remember the guy who foresaw Michael Jackson's death? Well, he also once got strange symptoms. Check it out. When I was about 17 years old, I, I was convinced that I was going to have a heart attack. Like, I, I could feel it in, in all my heart. I didn't sleep because I thought I was going to have a heart attack. My arm hurt a lot. I saw my hands getting green and getting big. And so I went to the doctor. So, pain in the arm? Swollen green hands? Damn, what did the doctor tell him? A, he said he had a lack of vitamins and iron. B, he told him to drink less coffee. And C, he told him he was fine. Okay. I saw your <laughs> smile. What are you smiling at? That guy is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> he is absolutely crazy. And that and that matches which one? I mean, uh, like, I'm gonna say with B. I think he's had B. too much coffee. <laughs> so I, I, that was the link. I was asking for the link, and I I got the right answer. So too much coffee, you get crazy. Yeah, That's right. Him. <laughs> coffee. Coffee. <laughs> what do you think, Jim? Mm. <laughs> Option one was? Option A was, he said, uh, he had a lack of vitamins and iron. 
Yes, that was the case, and this is why he was transforming into Hulk. Yeah, I Green love hands, it. That, that's Her explanations the, yeah. make total okay. sense, despite the fact that he, she might be right or wrong, but still <laughs> so, the explanations okay. make total sense. How about you, Patricia? Are you going to give an explanation that makes sense? <laughs> I'm going to go with, you know, what normally doctors say when you go there with that kind of symptoms, which is, you're fine. It's just <laughs> stress. And, takes and I just love the way she here. said it. So I'm sure that if that's the right one, the doctor would have said it in the way that she performed. Well performed, You're Patricia. Well. Mm -hmm. Okay, let the doctor speak. He checked my heartbeat and he said, it's all right, I'm not gonna have anything. I'm perfectly healthy. I still don't trust him, but I've lived like three years ever since, so I think I'm not gonna have a heart attack anytime soon. And I'm a big hypochondriac. Cute. Really? <laughs> Are you? Yeah. Okay, Patricia, job well done. So, but still, so he doesn't believe the doctor. But the doctor was right. Apart from being a psychic, he's a real a hypochondriac. Mm -hmm. What about you? Have you ever suffered any imaginary illness? Imaginary? No, I think I've got enough with the real ones I've got. So, <laughs> okay. Of course, but I don't imaginary. need to add on more. <laughs> I eat an apple a day and keep the doctor away. That's All good. Righty. Good for you. All righty. What can well, you say after you that, Matthew? Well, you were also Matthew? born in the 19th <laughs> century. Damn. No, every every night after or every day after a night of drinking, I'm pretty sure it's Ebola. <laughs> right? It's just very severe symptoms. A lot of profuse vomiting. I it's, I'm always convinced it's something serious. And then, can I, I say I, something? I Stop dislike. Drinking? <laughs> no, that's ridiculous. <laughs> I don't like to encourage you to keep talking with the final score, but the current score is you are winning with two points. Oh my god, Ooh. there we go again. And now I'm not sure if okay. that's encouraging you. Respect. you. Respect. I hope it doesn't. And you and you, you've got one point each. So okay. the two of you can beat him. Just Why? do it. That's your mission today. <laughs> Good luck. Are you Charlie? Yes, <laughs> I am. Yes. We're Charlie's angels, huh? And you're the third angel, yeah. Matthew. <laughs> Okay, time to raise the stakes. Let's take on the second round. Two points for every right answer. The speed challenge. Good. Okay, but first let's have a look at a language tip. So how do you deal with units of distance like miles and yards when you travel to an English speaking country? Well, let's listen to Mark Broderick's explanation and his trick for converting miles into kilometers. Hey, so you've probably found yourself driving along on the open road in the USA, Australia, the UK, and you see a sign and it says miles, 100 miles. Well, I'm going to explain to you the difference between the metric system and the imperial system. The metric system, of course, we use kilometers and meters, like here in mainland Europe. And the imperial system, of course, uses miles and yards. Now, my mathematics is not very good, so bear with me and I'll try and break it down to make it as simple as possible for you, okay? One mile is about 1.6 kilometers. Now, there's a whole other lot of digits there, just like pi, but I'm not even going to get into that. So, you're driving along Route 66, you see Las Vegas sign, and it says 72 miles. Now, before you start your calculations, remember, what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. Okay, so, back to the calculations. Generally, to calculate, you need to half it, add a tenth, and voila! you have your kilometers. You're probably thinking half of what? Tenth of what? Well, the 72, of course. 72, half of it is around 36. Then you take a tenth of the 72, which is roughly seven, and Bob's your uncle. You got 115 kilometers on the clock. Next one, you have yards. Now, yards is easier than kilometers and miles simply because one yard is about 0.9 of a meter. So it's roughly the same thing. Let's take an example. The footpath finishes in 200 yards. And you're thinking to yourself, man, how far is that? Well, you take the 200, you take about a tenth of that, which is 20, you minus it, and you have 180 meters to go. So, no matter whether your distances are in miles, or kilometers, or yards, or meters, I hope these simple calculations will help you to get to your destination safer and faster. Okay, let's continue. Guess what? Where our contestants are about to play the speed challenge. And you know we like to celebrate important days. But now, 
I don't want to trivialize really important dates, such as tomorrow, which happens to be the National Cappuccino Day in the US. But this Thursday was Guy Fawkes Day too. Isn't it that impressive? Uh, well, yes, yeah. yes, <laughs> I just love it. As you know, Guy Fawkes Day is the commemoration of the famous thwarted gunpowder plot to blow up the English Parliament in 1605. It's been traditional in the UK to light bonfires and put on uh, masks on the day. Remember, remember the 5th of November, gunpowder treason and plot. All right, hey, guys. Well done. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to say. Impressive. It. <laughs> <laughs> now with the COVID, everyone can be a hero and wear a mask, right? But not every superhero wears one. So I've just come up with this special round called Mask Hero, No Mask Hero, or Nonsense. <laughs> okay, great. I'll tell you the name of a superhero and you have to be quick and tell me if they wear a mask, no mask, or if the superhero just doesn't exist. All right? Okay. Isn't that interesting? I have Sounds to tell like you that we had real fun just rehearsing this part. Okay. And this is a good, good, good one speed challenge, so get ready for that. And three, two, one, here we go. Okay, the Hulk. No mask, no mask. No mask, Great. that is correct. Okay, here we go. Cockroach woman. But Patricia. Non-existent here. It doesn't exist, absolutely, thank God. <laughs> the Lone Ranger. Matthew. Mast. Mast. That is exactly. correct. Aquaman. Patricia. No mask. No mask, that is correct. Natasha Romanova, Aka Black Widow. Patricia. No mask. No mask. No mask, correct. Superman. Mask. Check. Mask. No. No mask. Yeah. Glasses. Which glasses when he's normal. Oh. So no mask. Glasses on. Oh, he's a normal guy. Glasses off. Oh my God, he's Superman. Oh, yes, it's true. EPD. Next one. Super last, the Scotty superhero. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's Matthew. Uh, nonsense. Doesn't exist exactly. <laughs> Scotland doesn't have any superheroes. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is super. But still, so you dubbed. You <laughs> dubbed it. I mean, like, you did just like. I was yeah, not very like, convinced. Okay. Not very you weren't that, that sure That's when true. you. Okay, so next one Spider Woman. Patricia. Mask. Mask. That is correct. Catman. Patricia. Catman. Yes. Yeah. Non existent. That is not correct. correct. Okay. Oh. Matthew. Mask. Mask. Mas, there you go. Job well done. Exactly. Mask. Next one. Wonder Woman. No Patrice. Yeah. <laughs> that was tight. It's really tough to no be pushed mas. master. No, no mask. That is correct. That goes to you, Patricia. You're yeah. welcome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dollman? But non existent? Oh. That is not correct. No. What did she say? She non existent dog She said nonsense. <laughs> No, doll, doll, doll man. Man. Doll not man. dog man, Patricia. doll man. mask. Uh, that is not correct. There you go. <laughs> no mask. Wow, well, man, how did you okay. know? Finally. That is crazy. Okay. Doll man is my, is my hero. <laughs> Here I go, get ready. Bad girl. Patricia. Mask. Mask, that is correct. Dress this. <laughs> I quit, you man. You go first, when then you I go first. I want to hear this name again. Is it what I said? What no, I heard? No, no. Oh. Brass, brass. I, I bra. said, I said, brass, brass fist. Yes, please. <laughs> and your answer is? Yes. Uh, <laughs> mask. Mask. It's no, not no. Uh, no. Doesn't exist. Doesn't, doesn't exist, exist exactly. Coachella. Sorry, it's sorry, Matthew. Doesn't exist. But get yes. ready for this one yes. too. <laughs> Armful of boy. Matthew! Uh, mask. <laughs> that is not correct. What? <laughs> no mask. No mask, that is <laughs> correct! You can no. exist. <laughs> you can exist. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. So in case you are wondering, Dollman has the power to shrink to a height of six inches and arm fall off boy can actually detach his limbs <laughs> when he, and then he can use them as a weapon to <laughs> to hit his enemies, and I need to stop here. So she is a big fan. Okay, anyway, if you oh, could God. choose, what superpower would you like to have? Oh. 
What superpower? I would love to know it all. You don't? No. To what? To what? <laughs> to what? Thank you, that's oh, very kind of wow. you, but no, I don't. Uh, invisibility, why not? That would be cool one. Nice one. An invisible cloak. And what you what, what would you do with it, Chella? Um, well, sneak into places and probably learn things and maybe earn a lot of money things being that you a, a have proper learned. spy. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh -huh. How about you, Matthew? Interesting. If I had to pick a superpower, I'm going to go with flying, the ability to fly. This way I can skip the lines at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> As a reminder, let's check the score. Patricia, with her superpower of knowing it all, is ahead with 13 points. Wow, Matthew well is just, I mean, just right behind with 10 points. You can fly and catch her very easily. Right. And Shella is doing okay with seven well-deserved points. Okay. Job well done, Shella. Okay, it wasn't but... easy to beat those two. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, but <laughs> the winner will be decided in the lyrics challenge. Exactly, that's why I said she's going to read out a few verses to each of you and you have to guess which song or artist they uh, belong to. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely, and I know Patricia prefers to sing. So we will also accept that as a right answer. Okay. That goes to you, Patricia. <laughs> if you get it right, you win three points. If you get it wrong, the question will pass to the next contestants. Okay? Right. All right. So let's start with my beloved Patricia. There we go again. Here I go. Listen up. I keep a close watch on this hurt of mine. I keep my eyes wide open all the time. I keep the ends out for the tie that binds because you are mine. Yeah. <laughs> no idea. Sing it for me. <laughs> no idea whatsoever. What? Really? Really. Well, no. I'm sure you all know it. You want to try to just put it, I mean, put I don't a know. tone on it? Just to say something. Next, Frank shall Sinatra. I? Uh, that is, uh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll see, we'll see, we'll check it out. Matthew? Yeah, I was going to say Elvis. Elvis, so we've got two Elvis, and, and so you think that we are moving forward to another contestant to say the same answer that the one who was um, apparently the one who had to. I get really, it. I really trust her. Uh, I can Even tell. when she's wrong, I, can I still tell. Okay, trust guys, her. listen up. I keep a close watch on this heart of mine. I keep my eyes wide open all that's, the time. That's hard, Johnny Cash. That's right? the one, yeah. We trust you, but you disappointed us. Because you're but that was a hard song. I mean, I, we, we yeah. know you are. Yeah. This was, yeah. that was going to be my guess, but I had ring a fire in my mind. You are the superhero with the know-it-all power. No, I, I'm not. That's why I'm wishing for it. <laughs> we were wrong, Marcella. <laughs> well, you know, um, almost. No, almost, almost. You say almost. Okay. Yeah. All right, guys, I Walk the Line, a famous song and a movie, too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I Walk the Line, one of the country hits by Johnny Cash, and the title of the biopic about him starring Joaquin Phoenix. Cash actually said that the lyrics came as fast as he could write. He finished them in just 20 minutes. Probably he wow. was late for something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next song, Shallow, that goes to you. Pay attention. What you want, baby, I got it. Mm. What you need, do you know, I got it. But all I'm asking is... For love. That is not your age. That goes to you, Matthew. Do you know it? For a little respect. Listen up. What you want. The amazing one, yes, absolutely, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Uh, Respect was released by Otis Redding in 1965, yeah. but it became a hit with Aretha Franklin, of course, which uh, who changed the lyrics, adding uh, the R-E-S-P-E-C-T and transformed the meaning of the song. Amazing, amazing. Okay, man, with a little respect for me, please. Impossible. Damn, <laughs> I made up all this thing just to give you the message but okay your turn Matthew see if you recognize these lyrics listen up but I say no no oh. no yes I've been black but when I come back you'll know no <laughs> no 
Sounds like what my ex-wife. Do no? you no, think? No, no, no. I think that is uh, Amy Winehouse trying Please. to go to rehab. Yeah. At <laughs> least enough. They tried to make me go to rehab. I said no, no, no. <laughs> yes, I've been black, but when I come back, no, no, no. Yes, exactly. Rehab from the album Back to Black. Probably the best known hit by Amy Winehouse. As you surely know, it's an autobiographical song about her refusal to enter a rehab clinic. All right, guys, only one song left, but let's check the score first. Matthew is unexpectedly winning with 16 points. Wow, but Matthew, Patricia, well the know it all woman, is ahead. I mean, not ahead, but a bit behind with 13 points. And Shella just decided to keep her seven well deserved yes. points, <laughs> and not? she just decided to stick with them. It's my lucky number. I seven. get it, I yep. get it, yeah, and I respect that. Well, you know, we like to raise the stakes once more for this one. Now, this is uh, for all of you. Five points for whoever gets it right. Use your instruments, guys. That's right, but just keep in mind that if you get it wrong, we'll take five points away from you and uh, you'll give the other contestants a chance. Okay, here we go. Listen up, because these verses are questions. Ooh. Where can you find pleasure? Search the world for treasure? Learn science technology? Where can you begin to make your dreams all come true? On the land? Or on the sea? Where? Do you just, know it? Yeah. Where? Well, Where? Just think about the sea. Think about it. I'm going to repeat. Sea. Yeah, no, they should exactly. Think about Where? the sea. Get wet. Under the boardwalk. That is no. uh, not correct. We'll oh. take it out. But uh, it's not correct. That's five points out of Ooh. you. Uh, okay, it's getting now. exciting. Okay, I'm going to um, repeat it because you know the song. You know the song. Yes, it's Where a very can popular you begin song. to make your dreams all come true on the land or on the sea? Where? In there is a question. In where? The, where in where the can sea? you find? In the yellow submarine? Beyond the sea? That is not correct. In the where can you find pleasure? Think about pleasure. Where you can, where can you find pleasure? <laughs> Search for the, you know it, but you are disqualified. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 you no, cannot no. answer. Oh, where can you find pleasure? Search the world for treasure. Learn science, technology. Where can you begin to make your dreams all come true? In the Navy! That is correct! Oh, 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 oh. Amazing! Navy. Of course, it's the only place where you can find flesh. <laughs> well, uh, let's now. just say that In the Navy was the last top 10 hit by village people in the US. Actually, they were allowed to uh, film the video on a US uh, Navy ship in exchange for the rights to use the song for a recruiting campaign. But funnily enough, and no one knows why, the Navy Never use the song. Yeah, never right. use it. <laughs> Unbelievable, right? Okay, let's exactly. check who won because I see a twist here. Today's winner is the know it all woman, Patricia, with 13, but Shell is just right, 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 right behind with 12 amazing points. And the loser for today is Matthew oh. with 11 points. Loser, wow. but with dignity. With respect. With re <laughs> exactly. 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 With uh, lots of respect. Absolutely. Well, um, congratulations to all. Chela, thank you for coming. I hope thank you, you had a great invitation. time. Yes, absolutely. Very happy to be here. Well, okay, here you can in the come. Navy. Uh, you're free here. to come next time when, or whenever you want. Anyway, uh, this is the end of the show for today. Nice. Matthew, Patricia, Chela, thank you so much. Thank and you. this is the end of Guess What? And also today's episode. We'll be back uh, next week. Until then, follow us on social media. There you will find the Guess Word by Mario Serra. The clue is to stroll with a Chinese pen, and that's four letters. The solution next Saturday at 4 p.m. And in the meantime, please stay healthy and have a great week. Bye-bye.